Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. Lots coming up this afternoon. As always, we'll be getting the latest on the situation in Israel. We're going to talk about Greta Thunberg's arrest and charging in London, and uh, how social media companies are censoring their users' rights to free speech. Oh yes, and the small matter of the uh, a man being uh, jailed for 11 years for smuggling thousands of people across the channel. I'm joined throughout uh, the show today by Brendan Chilton. He's chief executive of the Independent Business Network and uh, in, a, in, a, in a past life, also uh, chair of Labour Leave, the Labour campaign for, for Brexit. Hooray. Um, um, we're going to be uh, talking, obviously, about Israel and these horrific events, this bombing of this mm. hospital in Gaza City last night. It's feared that 500 or more people could have died. Last night, at one point, the figures were put up to possibly 800. Again, it's still unknown. We've seen doctors posing with... I have to say, a really quite grim sight with uh, children, uh, dead children wrapped in shrouds, some their faces actually on, on, on the show. And we have, well, uh, basically an explosion, not just at a hospital, but an explosion of outrage around the world, understandably, mm. at, the, uh, at an attack of some sort on this hospital. We're going to be talking uh, to a military defence analyst, we're going to be talking to representative of the Israeli embassy as well and other guests. Joe Biden, US president, flew in uh, today after this event last night, um, after this summit with uh, various Arab leaders has been cancelled as a result. Things are getting incredibly inflamed and everything is now riding on who was responsible for this attack. Um, who do you believe? Because the Israelis are saying this was a, an Islamic jihadist group that was a misfired uh, missile uh, aimed at Israel, um, and the, they presented evidence today. The, the Hamas, other Palestinian authorities, are saying this was a deliberate attack by the Israelis. Uh, well, the Israeli Defence Force have presented what I think is fairly credible evidence uh, that this was an attack uh, by Hamas, perhaps a rocket that didn't quite go as far as they wanted or landed too early. Which has happened before. Which has happened yeah. before. Uh, the Foreign Secretary, a few moments ago, said that the British government are not making a view yet because they don't know, it's too early to tell. Do you think that's the right response? I think for the British government it is the right response because it is a war zone. It's incredibly difficult to get anyone in there to provide any independent verification. Uh, but the one thing I think everyone can agree on, this atrocity, whoever committed it, and as I say, I think the IDF's evidence is pretty compelling, it is a war crime uh, to attack uh, civilian units and hospitals, and whoever's done it, they need to be brought to justice yes, as soon that's as possible. Assuming, of course, it's deliberate. Well, even if it isn't deliberate, uh, firing in the direction of a hospital, uh, I think, is something that is just totally unpalatable for anyone. Indeed. Uh, especially in the circumstances... Well, we'll come back to you in just a few moments, because uh, uh, I, I do want to know what you think as well. Everyone's got an opinion, haven't they? So my question to you today is, with more than 500 Palestinians known to have died after that explosion at the hospital in Gaza, Palestinians and Israelis have blamed each other for the attack. I just want to know what your reaction is. Who do you believe? What do you think's happened? What do you think will happen as a result of this? Well, it's already had an impact on Joe Biden, the American president's visit to uh, Israel. It was supposed to be travelling to Amman in Jordan uh, to have this summit here with Arab leaders. That's now off as a result of this attack. Uh, so I'd just like to know generally your reaction. Get in touch. Text me on 8722. You can get in touch on X, previously called Twitter, at TalkTV. Well, following that deadly explosion at a hospital in Gaza City, the IDF says it has evidence, as we've just been discussing, that it was caused by a misfired Palestinian rocket from within Gaza that had been aimed at Israel. And it is a claim that's been backed up by the US President Joe Biden, who arrived this morning for talks with Benjamin Netanyahu. Meanwhile... I'm deeply you... sad. I'm not sure if we're playing a clip or not, are we? But on Gaza, yes. And based on what I've seen, it appears as though... It was done by the other team, not not you. But there's a lot of people out there not sure. So we got a lot we've got to overcome a lot of things. And it also means encouraging life saving uh, capacity to help the Palestinians who are innocent caught in the middle of this. Uh, that was Joe Biden meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, meanwhile, Europe remains on high alert with six French airports evacuated this morning over suspected bomb threats and a synagogue in Berlin has been firebombed. This, as the chief of MI5 has warned that the terror threat could spread to the UK. All in all, not a happy day for anybody. Joining me right now is military and defence analyst Colonel Simon Diggins and he joins us on the line. A good afternoon to you, Simon. 
Good afternoon, Julian. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I wish again it was under happier circumstances. Um, these claims and counterclaims that we've had uh, from, well, almost immediately, actually, within minutes of the, the strike uh, of the bomb explosion at, uh, at the uh, hospital in Gaza, immediately there were claims that this was an Israeli attack that was condemned uh, by the Palestinian authorities, by other Arab leaders as well. I, the Israelis said, first of all, they, they needed to... You know, they didn't think it was theirs, but they wanted to look at it. This yeah. morning, there was this press conference, as Brendan was just discussing, where we had an IDF uh, a spokesman uh, producing evidence, video evidence, that suggesting that they believe this was actually a misfired rocket barrage by the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group aimed at Israel, they did misfire, they produced a, a, a transcript of, uh, of a conversation they believe they'd intercepted of uh, this, this group discussing a misfired rocket, the evidence that other rockets had actually been fired in the direction of the hospital, and they say this, you know, basically, it wasn't us. Are you convinced by the explanation they provided so far, or do we need to have independent verification of this? I think independent verification would be really helpful. Um, they often say that truth is the first casualty in war, and... We, it's a, we have long experience from other complicated wars where claims and counterclaims come out first. When we were in Afghanistan, it was always the, the problem we had there. We weren't necessarily first with the news. We always want to be first with the truth. And I think that's the key thing to try and get out of this. What it does tell you, though, is the sheer horror and danger of, of conducting operations in this kind of built-up environment. So whether it turns out in the end to have been a, a, a misfired rocket from Islamic Jihad or a, a, a poorly targeted missile from uh, from Israel. Uh, we need to find out the absolute truth on this. Well, indeed. Um, it's very interesting that our Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, um, in a statement to the House of Commons just after Prime Minister's questions, has basically said, you know, the, the, the government is, uh, is, is not giving a view yet. They want to see the evidence. We'd need to see, you know, the, the, the evidence of the missile, if it was Israeli. We need to see the shrapnel. We'd need to see some of that evidence. Some of that was presented by the IDF, that there wasn't a big crater and that this would be the sort of impact you would see, that the, the buildings are still standing, suggesting this was essentially explosion in the car park and, and, and that that was, the, that was what had caused this extensive, horrendous, extensive damage. Um, a lot of that, you know, to those of us who are not experts, and this, it feels like that is a reasonable explanation. But I suppose one of the things we should look at also is who benefits from this and who loses the most from this? Because there are basically four options here, realistically, aren't there? That this was a, a deliberate attack by the Israeli Defence Forces, that this was an accidental missile strike, they were aiming somewhere else by the IDF, that this was a deliberate attack by the Palestinians, a group of some sort, to make it look like the Israelis had attacked this hospital, um, or it was this accidental um, missile that hit. Um, it seems to me that there is under no, there's no circumstance where this is in Israel's interest for this to have been a deliberate attack. They know that this makes it harder for the US president and other Western allies to support them. They know that this would have put in jeopardy that su summit of Arab leaders that was due to be held with uh, Joe Biden this week. They know they would face huge condemnation around the Arab and the Western world as well. So can we, can we rule that out, at least, that it was a deliberate attack by Israel? I think that is absolutely correct. As, as you say, you're, 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 you've, you've very well outlined all the various options. I don't think Israel would deliberately target a hospital, even if there was evidence that, that Hamas or Islamic Jihad were using it for storage or even, God forbid, for actually as a launch pad for missiles itself. It doesn't, unfortunately, rule out an accidental one from there. But you're quite right in terms of the consequences uh, of this, um, the impact of, you know, first and foremost, all hospitals in war are protected under the Geneva Convention. To, to, to sort of breach that Geneva Convention by a functioning Western democracy uh, would be a gross breach of, of, of that. And you know, Israel is already under under the under the spotlight for this in terms of their response to to Hamas. So I can't imagine they'll deliberately target uh, a hospital. To it said it doesn't necessarily rule out the the um, the, um, the the possibility of um, an accidental one. As far as the Palestinian options from there, yes, again, I mean, given 
what we think Hamas's strategy is, which is to bring Israel into, uh, into uh, if you like, the, the shame of the world uh, by uh, some massive and disproportionate response to, to what's happened by, by Hamas. Um, there is a possibility they might, they might conduct a, 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 a missile strike on a hospital and hope that they can somehow blame the Israelis. But that's a high-risk option uh, for them. They have also got some er elements of, of, of discord between Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Mm. We often count them as part of the same, but they are separate organizations. And in, in the past, Hamas have fought Islamic Jihad basically for control of what's going on. So I think just the, as you rightly say, by focusing on the consequences, the more likely option is probably an accidental uh, attack onto the onto the hospital, um, possibly from the Israelis. But as Brendan pointed out, you know, lots of the evidence now is pointing that direction. Direction. But you know, we do need to try and get to, to something approaching ground truth and an independent investigation would be appropriate. Yeah, indeed, of course, the, the, you know, the, the ground is, is actually under the control of, the, of, of Hamas uh, right now in Gaza, so they'd have to provide access. Um, with, obviously, there are some, some journalists, some independent journalists there, but again, their access uh, might be questioned uh, as well. Um, you were a, a, a Middle East defence attaché, um, and, uh, and, and of course, you know, you've worked in this area as well. Do you think that in terms of the, the Jordanians and others, you know, calling off this summit in, in Amman, that, that this was something that they, they will have felt forced to do under pressure from others in the Islamic world? The idea, you know, the outrage we've seen uh, calls for demonstrations, we've seen, you know, the sacking of, uh, it is, you know, US embassies, we've seen some terror attacks, terror threats in Europe as well. I'd like to talk about that as well with you. That, that actually they would have liked to go ahead, that the other Arab leaders, they don't want this. Saudis, of course, we're about to, we understand, you know, sign a, effectively, you know, a recognition accord with Israel, that this is their worst nightmare, but that this is exactly what Hamas wants. They want any sort of summit between the West and Arab leaders to be off the cards. I think that's right. And, and, and right lurking in the back of this is Iran. And Iran is competing with Saudi Arabia and, if you like, the settled states in, in, the, in that region for leadership of, of the Islamic world. All the states around Israel, with the, with the, with the, the, the exception of Syria and the partial uh, not, not non-compliance with, with, with Lebanon, have basically now rightly accepted Israel's right to exist. But you say Egypt and Jordan, important countries, and, and further, further afield, the Oman, Morocco, Bahrain, many of these countries have now worked out that actually they can they can a live with and, and want to be partnered with uh, with israel and the prize was there and i think the timing of hamas's attack uh, had a lot to do with what looked like a um, you know very tentative uh, and they talked about um, sort of cooperation and all those sort of areas not necessarily full recognition but some sort of agreement between saudi arabia uh, and and israel um, and Hamas, with their backers and with their allies in places like Hezbollah, saw this as a kind of fundamental shift in the balance of, of where things are, the dynamics, if you like, in the Middle East, and want to do something disruptive. They yeah. kind of worked out that Israel's response would be what it was, which is why I think Israel, regardless of, and there's lots of conversation about proportionality and everything goes there, you know, you know, the thing that I would be thinking if I was Israel General was, don't play Hamas's game. Yeah, this you know, is the Hamas point I've, I've put to the IDF, actually, the spokespeople, with some of whom have been, you know, uh, on, on many different media recently, that, you know, you, this, is, this is exactly what would have been predicted by Hamas as yeah. what they wanted. So are you not just walking into that? What do you think the, the expectation would be of what Joe Biden is going to achieve. We know that Anthony Blinken, his Secretary of State, has been, in a, he's basically been like the last busy. week in the Middle East, shut, you know, shuttling around, shuttle diplomacy, working every hour, goodness knows, uh, you know, God ends, to actually try and calm things down. What do we think Joe Biden's going to actually achieve? Because one of the key issues there will be getting back some hostages. Uh, we, and we've had representatives of the Palestinians saying, look, you know, if all the, if, you know, if, if, if we return, if the hostages are returned, then, then, you know, then that the, uh, the, the, the Israeli onslaught on Gaza should end. And I, I, I can't see that actually happening. But we had a spokesman for the Prime Minister here in the UK saying that at least seven British nationals have been killed and at least nine are now missing since Hamas launched its attack on Israel. Those numbers are changing up and down, some in the wrong direction, as we say here. Um, uh, uh, it looks like, you know, one, the teenage girl, the British girl, 13-year-old, now known to have died. But the urge, especially of the Americans as well, to get these hostages back, that is, is that one of the crucial aims that uh, he's got this uh, this week in uh, in Israel? I, I, he, he must, and that's one of the immediate aims. But, uh, but hostage diplomacy is a, is a, a notoriously fraught affair. We saw what happened uh, when um, 
but when 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 Biden basically handed over six billion uh, pounds to, uh, via Qatar to the Iranians, and you know it, it it distorts things. If I would say that what he should be doing with with the Israelis is actually saying to them, think about the long term. What is it we're trying to get out of this? Where do we want to be when all this is all this is over? And getting to focus on the long term because the geography isn't going to change. The people are not going to change. There's still going to be a, a, a you know two two million uh, Gazans from 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 Palestine, and the geography isn't going to change. What situation do we want to be in from that? Everyone sensible agrees that Hamas must be destroyed, but nobody thinks that the 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 the, the price of of destroying the Palestinian people is worth worth that. So somewhere between those two sort of extremes, there's got to be a way forward from that, and some kind of focus on where's the long term, what are we trying to do? I think is really important, and I would say that's part of the role of of the US, rightly guaranteeing Israel's security, rightly ensuring that no external powers will interfere with what they're going to do. But I think also, you know, as we should be, so critical friends saying to also, where, where, where do we want to be when this finishes? Are we just simply going to create another cycle of violence and counter violence, which creates another another Hamas and a black 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 Sabbath uh, day uh, like, like October the seventh. We really don't want that. And the, the optics, of course, are, are worse now. Without Joe Biden meeting with Arab leaders, meeting only with uh, the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Ben Netanyahu. Uh, we understand that Rishi Sunak, the British Prime Minister, will be travelling to the region tomorrow again, showing support. Uh, again, we're not going to be seeing that summit. Bringing it back home to what's happening here, we, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, there have been you know, six airports across France, including Toulouse Airport, being uh, evacuated over fears of bomb threats and terror threats. A synagogue in Berlin uh, has been petrol bombed with Molotov cocktails. We've seen you know, what happened in Brussels a couple of days ago. Two people shot dead, one other injured. Uh, the suspect claiming you know, he was revenge, jihadi revenge. Uh, we've seen uh, you know, numerous other events. There are real concerns that this is being brought to Europe. The MI5 chief yesterday has stated at a conference he was attending with other Five Eyes chiefs. Uh, first of all, we've seen, I think, them all together, um, basically saying, look, you know, yeah, the realistic threat is we are going to see that terror threat move to Europe and move to the UK. How concerned are you about that? No, extremely. I mean, you know, innocent people have been killed uh, and, and settled Jewish people who have every right to exist in peace uh, and security in, in Western European countries are, are under threat. And that is absolutely shameful. Uh, what we need to do is actually make a clear distinction between um, protecting the Jewish people, um, being very clear the open support for kind of Hamas type tropes, you know, clearing everyone from the river to the sea, wearing of symbols which are essentially um, Hamas, Hamas supporting symbols is not acceptable. I think everyone also understands the kind of the tragedy of the Palestinian people. And I think there's, it's reasonable to continue to say, whatever happens, we need to look after the Palestinian people. But that clear distinction that needs to be made between legitimate protests and illegitimate protests needs to be even stronger. And a strong message to all our Jewish friends and colleagues in, in this country and society, you know, that we are with them. And it's unacceptable that their lives should be threatened. Indeed. Uh, Colonel Simon Diggins, he's a former uh, military, uh, sorry, Middle East defence attaché and a military defence analyst. Now, I really appreciate your expertise and your time. Thank you for that. Let's come back to Brendan Chilton, who's joining me uh, all afternoon in the studio. Uh, he's chief executive of the uh, Independent Business Network. Now, look, neither you or I are experts in the Middle East. Oh, but everybody, everybody's now an armchair general Middle East expert, aren't they? And we were talking just before we spoke to Simon about you know, what are the options in terms of this uh, attack on the hospital. But this was exactly the sort of thing that was likely to happen, where tensions flare up. There are always... Look, even let's go with the best of the world, it's an accident on one side or the other. Um, the Israelis are saying, well, even if it was an accident or missile, it was a missile that would have been aimed at a, an Israeli, Israeli civilians. Um, but again, we know, we know that Palestinian civilians... Are, are coming under attack. We know that uh, in Gaza. It's the civilians on both sides who will suffer the most. That is the fog of war. That is the horror of war. Um, do you see any expectation that Rishi Sunak going to the Middle East, that Joe Biden being there now, that, that there is any possibility that Western powers can calm this down when they are seen largely by the Arab world as being on Israel's side and therefore not fair brokers? No, in reality, I don't think we can. Um, as you just said, in the in the perception of many in the Arab world, Britain, America, Western nations 
are there supporting Israel. It's not the case. Britain wants to see a peaceful solution uh, in the Middle East, as I'm, the President Biden said in the clip earlier as well today. Um, I think it's very unfortunate that this summit has been cancelled because, as you said to the guest just now, that only adds to the negative yeah. optics that this is the West just supporting Israel. Um, there are rep people from every nation living in that part of the world. Uh, it is, in that sense, a conflict that will affect every nation. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only way, it's going to sound a bit cliché, is dialogue. It's the only way yeah. the disagreement in Northern Ireland was solved and it is the only way this is going to be solved. Well, and again, more and more pictures of horrific um, acts of, you know, barbarity, whether it's what's happened with the, the massacre of Israelis on the 7th of October or when we see, you know, bodies of young children or even just the images we've seen from hospitals in Gaza. And we can use this awful phrase collateral damage but that doesn't don't think that feels mm. like it if it's your child no. as simple as that even with the mass movement of people we're told up to a million people now will have moved out of northern gaza to southern gaza but we know that bombing is still going on it's very difficult though isn't it from here to know what is true mm. what is you know what is what is lies what is propaganda what is what we one would like to believe what we you know who's who's speaking first who's truth who's lies and it's very very difficult for us to make a judgment but whenever there are more and more pictures of the horror of war because war is horrible um it just inflames everything even more do you think there's any possibility that there i mean we could all wish we have wishful mm. thinking any realistic possibility that the Israelis will not, for instance, launch their ground offensive in a matter of days. There's some talk about that moving back. But at the same time, let's talk about the Americans making sure that Congress has a law drafted, ready to provide aid and indeed even, even military aid, not just sending aircraft carriers, but actually, you know, some boots on the ground as well to help the Israelis. This, this has the makings of something much bigger. It has the makings of a major conflict, um, because if Britain and America, at the moment only America is talk talking about potentially boots on the ground, if that happens, you will get the allies of the uh, Palestinians doing the same, and this could escalate quite yeah. quickly. Um, all I would say is, I think, on the, the question of the collateral damage, it's a dreadful phrase, <laughs> but <laughs> it is, but in those sort of environments, highly built up areas, unfortunately, it's just that's, going to happen. That is, and again, Hamas chooses to uh, shoot their missiles and to and use civilian targets. They, they know what they're doing and they want, they, the truth is, they want those attacks. Listen, how concerned are you about what can go on back here in Europe and in, particularly in Britain with terror attacks? We've had so many terror attacks over the years. Um, there is a real concern, if MI5 chief is, is highlighting it, uh, that, you know, if, as things develop and explode, literally, in, in the Middle East, it's going to come onto our streets. It is indeed, and um, I think, you know, that obviously MI5 and the security and intelligence services will be watching that very closely. The one area I'm particularly concerned about, I've got a lot of Palestinian and Jewish friends, yeah. and both sides of the community at the moment are feeling particularly worried, particularly tense. Yeah. And I think we've got to, particularly the government and people, are, Positions of influence have got a duty to try and calm things down Absolutely. in the media and everywhere else to try and make them feel safe and comfortable. Absolutely. Brenda Children, more from you throughout the show. Well, my question to you today is that uh, well, more than 500 Palestinians believed to have died after an explosion at a hospital in Gaza. Palestinians and Israelis have each blamed each other for the attack. I just want to know what your reaction is to what happened or could happen as a result. Your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast. Benjamin says, world leaders need to step up and have an immediate ceasefire and seek peace in the likely in the likely format of a two-state solution. But again, they've been trying to do that for years, haven't they? Lindsay has tweeted, it's disgusting. Like Joe Biden said, many don't know who to believe, but it just needs to stop now. Enough is enough. And Michael thinks, regardless of whose fault it is, that they are all to blame for this situation. It's a general failure from so many groups, organisations and countries. It simply should serve as a massive wake-up call to everyone. Well, keep those responses coming in thick and fast. Text on 87222. You can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Coming up after the break, although we will return to this story at two o'clock, uh, up next we're going to talk about social media companies threatening free speech by using false claims of disinformation to censor opinions they don't like online. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm going to start making you all do that together with me. Uh, free speech is under attack. Again, of course it is. This time it's from social media censors using claims of fake news to silence opinions online that they just don't like. More than 100 academics, historians, and journalists have signed a declaration handed to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, a warning that social networks, government officials, and NGOs are attempting 
using to label legitimate views as disinformation. This follows revelations that a secretive government unit was working with intelligence agencies to monitor online posts criticising lockdown during the COVID pandemic. Well, joining me right now is Bryn Harris. He's the Chief Legal Counsel at the Free Speech mm -hmm. Union. A good afternoon to you, Bryn. Hi, Julie. Good to Thanks see Thanks for joining us. Well, I mean, I've got a special interest in this as one of the signatories uh, of this uh, letter to uh, Rishi Sunak, but also one of the journalists who was, I found, I still find quite bizarre, monitored online. Yes, tweets that uh, were in the public domain, but even some that were jokes that were flagged as misinformation, disinformation by uh, two different government units. Um, I've had some more information recently, which I think we're going to uh, talk about on air next week, about what they did with this information. And I've got to be honest with you, it's pretty, pretty darn sinister. Um, mm. The people who have signed this letter are from a whole variety of different backgrounds and views. I mean, you've got the author Jordan Peterson, you've got Julian Assange from WikiLeaks, you've got John Cleese, you've got Richard Dawkins, the historian Robert Toombs, the American whistleblower Edward Snowden, uh, Toby Young, of course, the Free Speech Union, for which you represent, I'm also a member, um, and many others who were involved with, say, exposing what was going on between social media companies like Twitter um, and after Elon Musk bought it, uh, what was really going on in terms of that. So um, tell, us, tell us how this is being done, first of all. Um, well, I mean, in, in terms of the, the monitoring of disinformation, it tends to be, uh, as far as I know, sort of left to really somewhat unaccountable uh, bodies and people. Um, I think we all know that um, Elon Musk's Twitter has created this new community notes system, which I think is a, a very good uh, uh, move in the right direction. It says that we essentially should sort of crowdsource our judgment of whether a new source is, is true or false. The alternative, which, which I think is much more problematic, um, is that social media companies may overly rely um, on those who a sort of self-appointed arbiters yeah. of, of what's true and what's false. Um, and that that obviously involves uh, uh, organisations really taking upon themselves a power that, that really shouldn't exist in a liberal democracy. Well, as you say, crucially, they are completely unaccountable. Um, you know, unelected, unaccountable people, even even the fact checkers. We have these sort of fact checkers at the BBC or f other fact check groups. I mean, I know one person who, who has been involved in fact checking me, um, who's a member of Extinction Rebellion. Well, I mean, do you think he's coming from a neutral stance, I wonder? Um, I mean, th and this is the thing, I mean, I, I, what people choose to fact check. Whenever the BBC has got in touch with me with their fact checky people, I've always said, OK, uh, over COVID, what? Um, why have you not fact-checked this statement from this person? Why, why are you, why you fact-checking what little old me is saying, um, but not what the government, government you know, advisers are saying? And this is the thing, isn't it? It's just got to be this idea, this norm, that somehow, if someone has written something that, I don't know, whoever decides they don't like, often just the social media companies, often, as we now know, in cahoots with the US government, the British government and other governments, uh, as those, those exposés of what was going on behind the scenes at Twitter before Elon Musk purchased it, um, mm. that, um, that they can just censor it. Whereas uh, what my view, and I'm sure your view would be, and people watching and listening to this show, I hope would be, if it's a bad idea, if it's untrue, we can challenge it online. We can point out, no, the evidence doesn't back you up. This is a wrong claim. This is why that's wrong. We can challenge those ideas. I'm not threatened by anyone posting something untrue or unverifiable because I can challenge it. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, we've always had um, arbiters of truth and falsity in political debate, and, and they're called voters. <laughs> um, and it's for uh, a free electorate informed by a free press to make decisions for themselves about what they think is true and what is false. Um, now, I, th I think these these sort of arbiters are, are making a huge demand. They're saying, trust in our wisdom and benevolence <laughs> to, to control the flow of information into the public square. Now, I mean, I don't think there's anybody I would trust, not even, you know, David Attenborough, um, to, to hold that power and to put the thumb on the scale and to say, this is... This is the regulated debate you can have. And yeah. I think the, the important thing is that those academics, the um, uh, technocrats, moderators who, who make these decisions as to what's true and false, well, how do we think they do it? They have arguments. They get things wrong. Yeah. 
We, but we know, uh, we know they get things wrong. I've had people challenge me on things I've said and tweeted about COVID during you know, 2020, 2021. And they said, well, you got this wrong. Yeah, I didn't get everything. Well, funnily enough, not an expert, didn't get everything right. But I tell you what, put my what I said and my interpretation of evidence against an awful lot of the experts, I have a much better hit rate than a lot of them, given the evidence we are seeing now. But this is the thing. Um, we, this kind of went into overdrive over COVID, but it mm. was already happening. I mean, Brendan Chilton's here in the studio. We'll come to you in a second on this. Um, uh, over things like over Brexit, this idea, oh, you can't say that because that's untrue. No, challenge it if it's not true. Um, and, and this idea that somehow these things are dangerous, that it is dangerous for us to hear these ideas, even when someone is spouting something horrific, even if it's someone who is, you know, shouting horrible racist things or misogynistic things. I'm of the view I would rather know that that's what those people are saying and thinking and have the ability to challenge it. And then we can make a judgment about that person and what they've said. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one thing we've we've got to accept is that rumour, especially in times of war or, or, or in sort of troubled times, is a fact of life. It's part of the human condition. You go back to Homer, you have portrayals of rumor. Um, so we, we, we can't live in this sanitized world where we're all talking to each other, but there's a sort of, you know, ministry of anti-rumor, which is gonna prevent this basic sort of fact of human life. So I think to a degree, we've got to accept um, that, you know, we've got free sources of, of news and we've got you know, responsible journalists, but there's gonna be rumor, it's gonna happen and we can't yeah. protect ourselves. Uh, from things like that. Absolutely. I think the other danger is that we end up with this real two-tier system uh, where the experts are allowed to debate, they're allowed to go wrong, they're allowed to err, uh, and everyone else just has to have this really sanitised conversation. Yeah, well, because they, they're yeah. treating us like children. And the key thing here is it's all about, isn't it, treating us like children, protecting us, keeping us safe. When did we hear that before? Brendan, children, let me let me come to you on this, because um, the Westminster Declaration, which say I'm a signatory of, so, said, you know, we obviously all saw the, the, the wording beforehand, we are all deeply concerned about attempts to label protected speech as misinformation, disinformation and other ill-defined terms. What's more, time and time again, unpopular opinions and ideas have eventually become conventional wisdom. Free speech is our best defence against disinformation by labelling certain political or scientific positions as misinformation or malinformation. Our societies risk getting stuck in false paradigms that will rob humanity of hard-earned knowledge and obliterate the possibility of gaining new knowledge. Pretty much every idea that is currently now accepted as, yeah, that's a given, was at some point the sort of information, the sort of idea that would, under these rules, have been censored. Well, give me a pen and I'll sign that because I believe in total free speech. Absolutely. By the way, you can. People can sign this. It's like the Great Barrington Declaration or yeah. you know, lockdown. You people can sign this online. Well, I, as I say, total free speech because only from that do you get a sort of collective decision as to what is and isn't acceptable. When Nick Griffin appeared on Question Time... That's the former a, head of the BNP. A few years yeah. ago, there, it was heated up, it was going to be this great debate, and when he got on there, his ideas were completely trounced by a rational, normal order. I mean, literally overnight, when, support boom. the party. And that's the thing, the, you yeah. know, the, the disinfectant is a great is a great level. Like you, during the Brexit campaign, you know, there was a whole like, the idea that there was disinformation, mm. misinformation about you know, the £250 million pound for the NHS, the big red bus, and apparently everyone was swayed by that. But again, that was sort of campaigning debate, uh, but it was open. But people could people could hear the debate and then they could decide. They can. And nowadays there is so much information yeah. at our disposal. Any statement you see online, you can, within a few clicks on Google or another search yeah. engine, prove or disprove it. Yeah, indeed. Although, I have to say, coming back to you, Bryn Harris, I'm always amazed when I'm trying to look up a particular, say, article, I remember reading about this, and I'm on Google, I'm fascinated by how incredibly biased so much of the, the choice, the, the options are that come up, especially if it's anything on anything green or, or anything environmental or anything to do with um, COVID. It, there is still an incredible bias, isn't there? Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's toxic. Because these decisions are being made in a black box, by people who aren't accountable, um, we're often left thinking, how reliable um, is this source of information? Yeah. And you might think, I used to trust this new source, but now I can't. And I think when we start having those misgivings 
that everything's been doctored by people who might not be entirely on the square. Mm. Um, I think it creates a sort of toxic mistrust and a yeah. feeling that you know we can't rely on things that perhaps previously we could. And especially when it comes to scientific debate, the whole point of science is you, you're able to challenge it. It literally isn't science if you're not challenging it. I also found it extraordinary during COVID when top some of the world's top epidemiologists, you know, Oxford University, Stanford, and 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 elsewhere were basically being censored uh, by some Egypt in a T-shirt somewhere in California. Quite extraordinary. Uh, Bryn Harris, thank you so much. She's from the Free Speech Union. I must declare I am I'm also a member. Um, getting your reaction today to, of course, the horrific news out of Gaza that more than 500 Palestinians believed to have died after that explosion at the hospital in Gaza City. Palestinians and Israelis are blaming each other for the attack. This is the fog of war. I'm asking for your reaction, though, to those events. Charlotte says, why would anyone believe the word of Hamas when they're terrorists? It's almost as if people want it to be Israel so they can turn against them. Terence has messaged to say, at this point, we have no way of knowing. When humankind descends to these depths of savagery, it almost ceases to matter. And Val says, however it happened, it's terribly sad for the true victims and their families. I hope Hamas can be destroyed as quickly and efficiently as possible. Well, lots more of those messages coming on. Do get in touch at Talk TV and text 87222. Coming up after the break, Greta Thunberg has been arrested and charged with a public order offence after a protest in London yesterday. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV, all together now on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Greta Thunberg, everyone's favourite eco activist, has been charged today with a public order offence. That's after being arrested yesterday at an environmental protest in London. The 20 year old Swedish activist was put in a police van after officers led her away from the Intercontinental Hotel on Park Lane, where a meeting of oil executives was being held. The Met Police arrested 14 people who had told crowds to reclaim the power whatever that means, and hit out at what they called spineless politicians who they say have failed to act on global warming. Is everyone awake again? Um, joining me right now is Ralph Schulhammer. He's a professor of economics at Vienna University and joins us once again. I'm trying to make a regular thing of this, Ralph. Good afternoon to you. So great to be on, Julia. I hope we can make it a regular thing. So Absolutely. I take your word for it. Absolutely. Now, you're going to have to keep moves, keep still because the sound just cut in and out there. So hopefully that will we'll make that better. Now, the protest that Greta Thunberg was arrested at uh, was by an organisation called Fossil Free London. We're going to go fossil free, apparently. Uh, and they were protesting outside the in Energy Intelligence Forum conference. It used to be called, and I rather like it, it used to be called the Oil and Money Conference. They used to be honest about what it was. It was about oil and about money. That probably didn't play too well PR-wise. They've gone for Energy Intelligence Forum. Um, the climate activists, including Greta, are basically saying they want, they want London to become fossil free. When do you think that's likely to happen? Yeah, well, I think the first thing we have to start with is uh, you viewers and probably everybody else is having a serious case of Greta fatigue syndrome. Um, she's becoming a little bit the Meghan Markle of environmentalism. I'm really just <laughs> waiting for her to marry a member of the Swedish royal family. Then really kind of she's up in this in this classes. Uh, I didn't even know she was in London until she got arrested. Just as a couple of months ago, nobody knew she was in Germany until she got arrested. So that seems to be this new PR coup. Wherever she goes, there's like this prearranged arrest so that anybody finds out that she's even there. Uh, the winds are shifting against this kind of climate activism. And we see it even now. If she wouldn't have gotten arrested, nobody would know that she was in London. No, indeed. But she always seems to be rather happy about getting arrested. It's happening more and more often. She always seems to smile and look perfectly happy about it. This is part of the aim. They, get, they then get publicity. I mean, to a certain extent, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm feeding into it. I shouldn't talk about it. I'm just encouraging them. But actually, the more we talk about these people, the more they're being exposed for the nonsense. And by the way, everyone who goes, oh, you should never go at Greta Thunberg. She's a grown woman. If you want to be an activist, if you want to tell everyone else how to live your life, if you get access to leading politicians and, and governments, then I'm afraid you're going to have to take criticism of the nonsense that you talk and the nonsense that you do. And it's all just a huge PR show. For example, I'm speaking to you now from the Arctic Circle. I'm in Norway currently at an undisclosed location. Are you planning to get um, and arrested? Everything... 
<laughs> well, it's 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 a, it's an exile, right? I have been exiled to to Norway, and everything here is fabulous, right? The Norwegians are rich because they sell all the natural gas to you Brits, um, so everything here works perfectly, and they do the same thing, right? They now renamed their energy ministry. They took petroleum out of the name, but you can rest assured that they will never take petroleum out of their budget. So all of this is becoming a huge PR gag. The the kind of the, the fossil age is not ending, as the geopolitical fractions are shifting. Everybody realizes. That, that we can't move on as we did uh, in the last couple of years. So yeah. a lot of this will be talked, but what's actually happened is very different. And you'll see this, some places will move faster, some places will move slower. But what's happening is that we are leaving fantasy land. Like we could afford luxurious idiocies as long as we were rich, but now as we get poorer, yeah. right, we can no longer afford well, this we idiocies. Were told, you've so got to remember, Ralph, and we, we've discussed this before, we were all told we are going to be rich, there's going to be another half a million green jobs, Labour still banging on about that here. Every Everything's going to be great. We're all going to be rich. Everything's going to be clean. The world's going to be safe. And then we're going to get all the credit for being the, the leaders on this. Brilliant. And then the bills started coming in. Then people actually started looking, people like you, looking into what is this actually going to cost and what's it going to achieve? It's A, it's going to achieve zero, nada, zilch, nothing. And B, it's going to cost a bleeding fortune at a time when even if we were rich, people would say, haven't we got anything better to spend this on? I don't know, like education, like paying doctors, like, you know, getting scanners, uh, you know, for, for, for cancer. I mean, surely this might be a bit of a more of a priority than, than the, the nonsense that they're talking about, basically replacing all of our technology with something which I think you were discussing with me last week doesn't actually exist yet. No, and it's also a geopolitical issue. Uh, just last week, for example, there was a sabotage of an, oil, of an uh, a gas pipeline in the Baltic Sea. Uh, we see similar things happening. Uh, we know now, for example, as tensions are increasing in the Middle East, like you want to have your energy as close to home as possible. So this is now not just an economic and financial or environmental issue. It's a geopolitical issue. Right? You cannot depend on places further and further away for your basic energy needs. This is a huge risk. You cannot expose yourself to malign players and there's a couple of them currently on the global stage that then can cut off your resources at any given point. So as I said, we could indulge in these ideas uh, during times of you know US hegemony when the world was under globalization and global peace. These days are gone for now at least and countries need to adapt accordingly. And I think this is true for Europe, it's true for the US and it's of course also true for Great Britain. So yeah. this is no longer just an environmental issue, it's a geopolitical issue, it's a security issue. Yeah, and it's a keeping the lights on issue. I still find it extraordinary. We have to have announcements going, oh, it looks like we probably won't have blackouts this winter. You think, really? I mean, are we in the blitz? Should we even be discussing this as an option? I just find it extraordinary. Do you think the world is waking up? Do you think the voters are waking up? And if this actually, we saw a, a by-election in London and Oxbridge where this was it, it was actually not a, a measure about climate change, measure about environmental pollution uh, from uh, from dirty vehicles. That was the idea um, of, uh, from Sadiq Khan for his expansion of the ULES zone. But actually, that was considered to be a bit of a deal breaker. As a lot of people have been saying, you know, these policies, they don't actually stand any scrutiny and they don't withstand even a, even one election simply because once voters actually know the truth um they ain't gonna vote for it i mean there's a problem you just mentioned it and this is that of course their regulatory agencies government agencies they are still staffed with people who have been marinated in this particular worldview right i mean we see it in foreign policy now with israel but of course also they have been marinated in this environmental doom-mongering ideology that the world is going to end tomorrow basically what governments around the west would have to do is what elon musk did at twitter right throw out 70 percent and restaff them with people that know what they're doing as i said before be we were idea. long enough no, I'm serious. We were long enough, uh, rich enough to afford these weird ideological indulgences. We can no longer afford this. We need now people in office that know what they do. So we don't yeah. need, for example, lift experience officers. We need actual engineers. Right? No, we don't also, need a diversity manager. We need somebody who knows how offshore drilling works. Yeah, this also, is the direction we have, we have when to we go. Have Energy and uh, and uh, you know COVID was it uh, climate change and energy security minister no no you can't be both it's one or the other Ralph Scholl an absolute pleasure thank you for joining us from Norway where apparently thank everything works because they've got a wonderful reliance on fossil fuels <laughs> um, coming back to you quickly in the studio Brenda Chilton.
Well, I think he's absolutely right. I couldn't have said it better myself. I knew you'd love him. Yeah, I knew you would. Good, great guy from Austria too, which was always good. Uh, we cannot have climate change and energy security at the same time. Voters are waking up to this. We should be fracking. We should be expanding the oil fields. We should even be looking at clean coal. Energy security is where we should Do be Do you going. think this is really changing and actually a lot of people are waking up to this? I absolutely think that. And I think the politicians, even those in the party I support, Labour, are waking up to this when they lost Do the by Do you think so? They've been fully on board. I think behind the scenes they're quietly doing that after the by-election in Uxbridge where voters went against those policies. Very interesting. More from Brendan Chilton coming up. We're going to be talking more about what's going on in Israel. It's more than 500 Palestinians have been killed in an airstrike on a hospital in Gaza City with a blame game erupting between the Israelis uh, and the Palestinians. I'm Julia Hartley-Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Back in a moment. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thank you so much for joining me. Lots more coming up this afternoon. We'll be getting the latest on the situation in Israel, as well as the jailed people smuggler believed to have trafficked, wait for it, 10. Thousand illegal migrants across the channel. It surely is an industry. 200 grand a boat he was making. Still with me uh, this morning, I'd like to... Oh, this morning. Oh, I've done another morning after all those years. The reputation. This afternoon, it's Brendan Chilton. He's the chief executive of the Independent Business Network and in a past life, chairman of Labour Leave. I'll never forget that. Um, and, of course, we're returning now to our main story of the day and that horrific, deadly explosion at a hospital in Gaza City last night where some 500 people or more are believed to have died. Well, the Israeli Defence Forces say it has evidence that it was caused by a misfired Palestinian rocket from within Gaza that had been aimed at Israel. It's a claim backed up by the US President Joe Biden, who this morning arrived for talks with Benjamin Netanyahu in the region. I was deeply saddened and outraged by the uh, explosion at the hospital in Gaza yesterday. And based on what I've seen, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not, not you. But there's a lot of people out there who are not sure. So we got a lot we've got to overcome a lot of things. And it also means encouraging life saving uh, capacity to help the Palestinians who are innocent caught in the middle of this. Well, that was uh, Joe Biden standing barely alive himself, actually, at a meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu after arriving this morning. Uh, of course, we do have claims from Hamas and other Palestinian groups that actually it was an Israeli attack on that hospital. Meanwhile, uh, Europe remains on high alert, with six French airports evacuated over suspected bomb threats this morning, and a synagogue in Berlin has been firebombed, as the MI5 chief here has warned that the terror threat could spread to the UK. Well, joining me now in the studio, along with Brenda Children, is Orly Goldschmidt, who's spokeswoman for the Embassy of Israel here in the UK. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. I wish we were, say, talking to you under uh, happier circumstances. We have claim and counterclaim about what happened at that hospital, the Al Khali uh, Hospital uh, in Gaza City. Um, the devastation is extraordinary. Uh, we know that many people not only were being treated at that hospital after attacks on uh, Gaza, but also uh, we know that many people were hiding there, were, were seeking uh, safety and refuge there uh, from uh, other, from their homes across Gaza. Um, the attack, we think, has left 500, could be more lives lost. Many are children. We've seen pictures of doctors posing with having a press conference with the bodies, I thought quite extraordinary scenes of bodies of children lying around them. Um, the claim immediately, almost within minutes, of it was from, from Hamas and other Palestinian authorities that this was an Israeli missile attack. The Israelis said they needed to look into whether they would be responsible or not. And this morning there was a press conference from the uh, Israeli Defence Forces and their spokesman saying, presenting evidence that this was not done by the Israelis, and this was a misfired missile from Islamic Jihad group that was aimed at Israel but had fallen short and landed on the hospital. Um, the world is divided on this. Do you think that the evidence that the Israelis have produced is going to convince anyone in the Arab world that this was not done by Israel? I think uh, that for the last 11 days, there is a trend uh, in the general media uh, they are using Hamas claims when we know what Hamas has done to Israel. 
on the 7th of October, and they're using Hamas claims uh, which spread disinformation. And I think this is very dangerous. We need to be very careful when we see, when we hear information from Hamas before spreading it out to the world, because the consequences can be dangerous. We've certainly seen some criticism of the BBC um, the, from from Israeli Defence Forces that the BBC um, had said, you know, reports of Israel missile attack on on the hospital in Gaza um, when Israel was saying they were not sure that they that it was one of theirs. It's interesting that Joe Biden arriving in Israel today has said that he believes, I think his phrase, the other team did it. He seems to be um, pretty convinced by the evidence. The British Foreign Secretary, um, James Cleverly, in the comments today has said that you know, Britain does not have an opinion yet. There is a need for some independent verification. I have to say, I, watching the press conference this morning, I thought the IDF's explanation was very convincing. It also tallies with... The, the realities on the ground of who benefits from this. A deliberate Israeli attack on the hospital would be, frankly, diplomatically insane. Uh, an accidental attack could happen when missiles are being fired into Gaza. It could happen. For the, for the Hamas, or the claim that this was this group, uh, this Islamic, Islamic jihadic jihad. group, um, that's exactly what it says on the tin, I'm guessing. It's one of those groups. Um, but that, uh, the, their claim that you know, they obviously denied this, and Hamas and other Palestinian stories have denied it. But, but we have seen misfired missiles before. The evidence presented by the IDF about you no know, crater, etc., etc., does seem to make sense. But as I, as I say again, is anyone in the Arab, Arab world interested in this? And how are you, whether well, the Israeli claims, how are you going to prove that without independent verification? And how do we get that? You know, we have published, we have released uh, a conversation between people from Hamas mm -hmm. explaining in Arabic that this is a, a, a missile that was fired from the Islamic Jihad. Uh, we're doing everything uh, we can uh, in the diplomatic uh, fronts and in social media. And we need the international uh, uh, media outlets to understand that this is not a game, that words have the power to create um, um, modern misinformation. They have the power to destabilize the, the, the Middle East. And I'm not saying it lightly. Mm -hmm. When uh, outlets report that Israel is firing at a hospital, first of all, please, uh, make sure that it's not a Hamas claim, because as you said, we know that Hamas have all the interest in, in spreading those lies. And second, wait for uh, in an investigation. Uh, and Israel has been very careful in, before they released information uh, in order to have all the ev evidence that could show that they were not there at that time. Okay. Um, so this is very important. OK, but again, with uh, Hamas controlling Gaza at the current time, um, unless they allow access for independent forensic investigators, we may never know the answer. I agree with you. That's a, that's, a, that's a huge problem and we need to take that into consideration. And I think journalists need to understand that they are in front of Hamas. Hamas are holding the, the health ministry, they're holding uh, the numbers. We don't even know if those 100 plus uh, people who have been uh, 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 killed by this terrible uh, uh, incident uh, is a real number. We, we don't know. We yes, know I, I think, again, we have to, in the fog of war, we have to take everything, you know, uh, just with who is making the claim uh, is crucial. In terms of how much this has derailed the visit by Joe Biden, the US president has arrived today. I wonder if there were some question marks about whether he, he would turn up at all. He wants to show, of course, solidarity with his Israeli allies, possibility, we understand, of the uh, British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, uh, going tomorrow. But he was also, the US, US president, supposed to have a summit uh, with other Arab leaders and Amman in Jordan. That's been cancelled. The, the Arab leaders have condemned this strike on the Gaza hospital. How much damage has this done to any possibility of this... I, mean, I don't think we use the word peace at this point, but of this, this, the escalation of tensions being sort of quelled a bit? You know, I think that at that stage, we just understand more and more that Hamas, not only that they don't care about Israelis, this we have seen, they, they have murdered our families, but they don't care either about the Palestinian people. And they would do 
anything in order to 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 keep on on attacking us um, so I, d I don't know if that specific incident is changing anything in the process I know that at the moment we need to do everything in order to protect our civilians from the next attack from Hamas and I have to mention that from the last 11 days there have been more than six almost 7,000 rockets fired at Israel one of them hit a hospital in the in the south of Israel and it's a non-stop yeah, the siren alarms, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, the center of Israel as well. So at the moment, we're really just at an at uh, unprecedented scale and we need to make sure that we protect ourselves. Okay, let's bring in some other voices. Uh, Dr. So Orly uh, Goldschmidt, Israeli uh, embassy spokeswoman, I hope you just stay for a moment. Just briefly to you uh, first, uh, Brendan Chilton. Look, there's no doubt this has completely derailed any attempt by Western powers to sort of try and broker some sort of calming of tensions. Well, I think it has uh, at the moment, certainly, because it's almost impossible given what's going on. But I think ultimately it is the aim of everyone to have some sort of peaceful solution to what's going on. But unfortunately, Hamas is a terrorist organisation uh, committing, as we've just heard from the representative of the Israeli embassy, several thousand rockets being fired into Israel, including at hospitals. Um, these people don't want peace. Uh, in the region. Uh, they, they don't believe Israel has a right to exist. Uh, it does have a right to exist. And it's absolutely right that Western leaders are expressing their solidarity with Israel at the moment. Thank you, Brenda. Let's bring in Dr Alan Mendoza now. He's Executive Director of the Henry Jackson Society and joins us. A good afternoon to you. Hello, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, who do you believe? Well, um, on the balance of probability, on the balance of evidence I've seen, which includes, by the way, mapping evidence by a group of independent experts who uh, track missile launches on a regular basis. Um, it, it appears, can't be 100% verified, but it does appear that the Islamic Jihad theory that it was a misfired uh, Palestinian rocket does look more likely than it was an Israeli uh, rocket. There's been no evidence suggested or presented at all that it's been an Israeli rocket other than Israel's firing rockets, whereas there is considerable evidence that has been presented, uh, including the corroborating evidence that was mentioned about the phone conversation, that this may well have been a Palestinian rocket gone wrong. So on balance, I'm on that side. But of course, I do stress the fog of war and we need final verification. But what with the facts that we know, and have you seen Joe Biden's come to the same conclusion? I believe HMG is essentially uh, on the same wavelength as well. Um, I think it's most likely a Palestinian rocket. OK. Um, and in terms of how this sort of has derailed any attempts by, you know, Joe Biden to meet, will be seen to meet Israeli leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, and then also Arab leaders in Jordan. That, of course, has been derailed, which, of course, probably what, what uh, the Islamic Jihadi group in, uh, in, in uh, um, Gaza would have wanted if, they, if this had been a deliberate attack. Because, as we know, one of the things that was coming down the line very soon was a, a sort of basically a rapprochement between Saudis and uh, and Israel, and again, that's been derailed. We talk about how everyone wants peace, but Hamas doesn't want peace, Hezbollah don't want peace, Iran don't want peace. They are upping the ante now as well. There are a lot of groups, even countries in this region, who actually don't have an interest in peace at all, do they? No, indeed, and you've highlighted uh, all of them there uh, in one fell swoop. The reality is that um, Hamas uh, is a genocidal terrorist movement, uh, with Islamist political beliefs that has no interest in peace with Israel or, for that matter, peace with its Palestinian brothers in Fatah or peace of any kind. Uh, you've highlighted Hezbollah, the Shiite uh, terrorist movement in uh, Lebanon, which is, of course, like Hamas, backed by Iran. Again, no interest in peace. What it wants to do is serve Iran's interest. And Iran's interest is very much to stir up uh, trouble in the region to deflect against what is happening in Iran, where the protests against the mullah's rule continues, and to try and disrupt any moves towards peace by its so-called enemies, uh, because it, it is, of course, worried that if uh, Israel, for example, gets together with Saudi Arabia, the Arab world normalizes with uh, Israel, then everyone will quite rightly look around and go, well, where's the source of instability? It is Iran. Uh, and this is one of the big issues, isn't it? And we've had the MI5 chief as well speaking with other um, um, Five Eyes allies or intelligence allies, uh, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, some, some of the world's leading uh, intelligence sources, although missed out on the, the 7th of October attack. Uh, certainly there's some failings there. But um, he's been warning of the terror that we're seeing over in the Middle East coming to Europe. We've already seen uh, you know, an attack on a synagogue in Berlin. We've seen a French teacher beheaded. Uh, we've seen an attack on, well, it was actually a 
you understand, a Jewish attack on a Palestinian boy in New York. Uh, we've seen uh, eight, six airports in France having to evacuate over a terror threats there today as well. Big concerns about what happens on the streets of the UK too. Yeah, totally. I think what you're seeing is a rise of radicalism, uh, a rise of radicalization, uh, and uh, an incentive for people now to throw in their lot with what's happening in the Middle East. It, it tends to be one-way traffic, I think you'll find, when it comes to the actual atrocities being carried out. It's uh, people who share, if you like, the ideological and religious beliefs of Hamas. So uh, we're talking about the jihadist movements, if you were, and their adherents. They are the ones who uh, are quite clearly... Uh, of most concern to Europe right now. That's why there are security alerts across Europe. It's not because they're worried about uh, uh, Jews being violent. They're worried about radical Muslims being violent. And that's uh, indeed what's been happening elsewhere. And we have to be careful in the UK as well. There's a lot of preventative action going on behind the scenes. There are um, efforts to make sure that um, a sort of marches and protests do not turn violent and that there is sufficient protection being given to the likely victims of any uh, uh, violence in the UK, which would be the Jewish community, given the rise of anti-Semitism already. And as a result, we have to be on our guard to make sure that there is no extremism allowed and that you know public order is maintained. Because if public order is removed for one group of people in the UK, then it frankly is removed for all of us. Yeah, indeed. And we have to remember, you know, there are there are still some ongoing issues in this country. We've seen sort of, you know, I mean, we've still got a, we've got a teacher, by the way, uh, in, in Batley, from Batley Grammar School, who's in hiding after being threatened uh, with death uh, after simply showing a, a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. We've got this sort of issues. We kind of think it's all over there. It's happening over there. It's not happening here. It is happening here. It's just a lot of the media just choose to ignore it a lot of the time and make excuses. Another person arrested who apparently got, has got a mental health problem. And we just try and ignore it and brush it under the carpet, don't we? Well, I think it's very difficult to ignore if you're walking through any of our major cities uh, over the past week angry crowd shouting Allahu Akbar in many cases and intifada, intifada. Um, that is not something ordinary British people can ignore, and they know it. And if even if the media, the mainstream media, chooses to ignore it, anyone who sees it and witnesses it is no doubt going to be worried. I mean, I'm a local councillor in London, and I get a, a full post bag from people uh, of all backgrounds who are concerned about what they're terming the public disturbances uh, in London over the past uh, week and a half. There's concern. And, um, but, you know, the government is doing its best, I think, to, to get on it. I think the other parties are also supporting the idea that we have to maintain cohesion. But we need action from the police to make sure that extremism is clamped down on. And if people are breaking the law or look to be doing that, then they need to be um, taken aside, uh, arrested and taken out of the equation. Indeed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alan Mendoza. Still with me is Oli Goldschmidt, who's spokeswoman for the embassy, Israeli embassy here in the UK. Also, Brendan Chilton's joining us for a whole show. Um, Oli, um, how concerned are you about what's happening on the streets here in the UK? Uh, we know the Jewish community is very concerned. We understand also many people uh, in, the, in the Muslim communities are also concerned that there will be sort of a, you know, fall back on them for actions of what, from what people are doing in the Middle East. What are your concerns? Um, you know, uh, first of all, I have to say that um, uh, we encourage uh, free speech and there's nothing wrong to me uh, for people uh, uh, protesting in the streets. But when it goes and it comes to glorifying the Hamas mm -hmm. and uh, having pictures of paragliders and yeah. chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, which means the, the total annihilation of the state of Israel, then we have a problem. And then I think here at that, at that point, we need to, to understand that, that that becomes dangerous. Are you confident that the police are are acting strongly enough, and there's quite an outcry about the protest at the weekend where you mentioned these two young women uh, with these paragliders glorifying the method by which people, uh, you know, terrorists, went into uh, that uh, that music festival on the 7th of October to machine gun yeah. and brutally assault and, and kill um, yeah. hundreds of young people. Um, I, I believe that the country does everything they can in order to protect yeah. us. Uh, I know that there is uh, there are more funds allocated to protect the Jewish community around the, the UK. So, okay. uh, yeah, we feel the support. Good. Well, uh, that's something, at least. Really appreciate you joining Thank us. Thank you. Uh, Oli Goldschmidt from the Israeli Embassy. Just a quick word from you, Brendan. Are you concerned about this, though? Because these, th these things that happen on the other side of the world have a habit of coming back to hit us here. They do indeed. And I think um, a friend of mine was at one of the protests supporting uh, Israel at the weekend, and she said there were an enormous number of police there. She felt very safe. But it's when people leave these protests that they feel under threat.
Yeah, indeed, that's that's the issue, isn't it? Ben and Children, more from you coming up, lots more top stories. Um, but also, I've been asking you to uh, tell us about uh, your views on this ongoing conflict, particularly your reaction to Hamas and Israel blaming each other for the deaths of more than 500 people, we are told, in an explosion at a hospital in Gaza last night. Lisa's got in touch to say a low-budget misfired Hamas rocket, not Hamas, I think they're being blaming another group, uh, Islamic Jihad group, that they're now using as propaganda. Max has tweeted to say humans are killing humans and it needs to to stop. Steve has messaged, I'm reserving judgment until I know categorically who is responsible. But the truth is frustratingly difficult to confirm. Keep your responses coming in. Don't forget you can text on 8722. You can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Coming up after the break, a people smuggler convicted of helping 10 thousand migrants come to the UK on those dinghies from the uh, from France has been jailed for 11 years that's up next I'm Julia Hartley Brewer you'll be talk TV on TV on radio online and on your smart speaker Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, a man thought to have trafficked, wait for it, 10 thousand illegal migrants across the channel to the UK on small boats has been jailed today for 11 years. Hiwa Rahimpur was arrested by the National Crime Agency. Their officers arrested him on May 2022 as part of one of the biggest people smuggling trials now ever held in Europe. The 30-year-old directed a major smuggling network from his home in East London, sourcing boats in Turkey and then delivering them to locations in Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands. Investigators believe that his gang made more than £200,000 on some crossings. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Ben Habib. He's a former MEP. He's now deputy leader of the Reform UK Party. Uh, good afternoon to you, Ben. Good afternoon, Julia. Um, I, mean, I don't know where we even start with this because the figures are just so extraordinary. I um, say This is one of the biggest operations, one of the biggest trials. 20 of the 21 defendants were found guilty. He's now, this man has now been uh, sentenced to, uh, to, to prison. Um, thank goodness. But let's just start, first of all, with the numbers involved. 10,000 migrants, illegal migrants, smuggled across the channel by just this one people trafficking operation. This gives us an idea of the scale of this. But this man, of course, says, hey, I wasn't the boss. I, I was just a cog in the machine. It wasn't me, Gov. Well, he probably was a cog. It probably is a bigger organisation than, you know, just the uh, 10,000 that he... Um, it's a bigger organisation that got those 10,000 people across the channel, I'm sure of that. Uh, you know, that, that accounts for about over a fifth of the take... Uh, uh, of crossings, if you like, in 2022. Um, so it's a big catch. But what's remarkable about it for me, Julia, is that this is the first major criminal that's been banged up for these crossings, which seem to take place with impunity. And it's not as if people smuggling is undercover. You know, 330,000 people, according to the EU, entered Europe illegally last year. They're visible. They walk along the same routes channeled by the same people, using the same boats, launching from Calais in the same places. And why is it that law enforcement in Europe seems to be completely asleep at the wheel? Yeah. We should be seeing tens of thousands of these prosecutions. People should be banged away regularly. And then, of course, the other really eye-catching thing is that this man had successfully applied for asylum himself. Well, I mean, let's even let's UK. just go there, because these, <laughs> these facts are quite... I mean, I read this, I thought... I mean, this is just, it's taking the mick doesn't do justice. So, turns out this man arrived in Britain quite some years. He's 30 years old. I mean, well, credit to him. The man, I mean, if he went into, if he went into legal work, the man would be a very successful businessman. Um, he, he, arrived, he arrived um, back in, I think, uh, 2016, well, when he claimed asylum. He claimed, he came in hiding on a lorry. He originally, by the way, tried to set up a business as a barber. That failed, so he opened a small food retailer selling confectionery. And it turned out people were coming in to use the Hawala banking system, which leaves almost no trail, and they were using it to transfer money to enable them to pay for themselves or other members of their family to pay for these trips on dinghies across the channel. And he obviously thought, oh, I think I'll, I think I'll get in on this. Um, so he, he's charging up to six grand for each one of these uh, places on these boats. But what is really extraordinary is he, he applies for asylum. He claims to be from Iran, for, I mean, he was uh, being a, a subject of persecution. But it is later emerged that actually he was probably 
not from Iran, he, this wasn't his name, and that he is, in fact, Hama Koshnau, and he's actually from the Iraqi city of Erbil and is an Iraqi Kurd, but basically he thought he had a better chance if he said he was from Iran. So we don't know who this guy is. He arrives in this country smuggled in the back of a lorry, which used to be the main modus operandi for smugglers until uh, they yeah. decided it was easier to get in by boat. Um, then he sets up a store... Uh, he gets given asylum, sets up a store, and then starts bringing tens of thousands of other people over. I mean, we've slept, walked into this nonsense. Yeah. We have completely, and it evidences why borders are so important and why enforcing borders is so important. We need to know who's coming into this country. And frankly, our asylum system is a joke. Apart from the backlog of 180 odd thousand applicants that are waiting to have their application determined, uh, we do know, we've heard Home Secretary instructions in order to speed up uh, getting rid of that backlog, to just do it on, in, on written applications, not to interview people. Mm -hmm. And if you do get to the interview stage and you suspect someone's lying to you, not to press them too hard, because they might have come from traumatic experiences in their past. So our whole system has opened itself up to this abuse. You mentioned that the lorries were their favorite way to come across until they chose boats. Actually, it was us that indicated to them that we're so weak so politically inept that if people assault the United Kingdom across the channel, we will let them in. Yeah. And what we've well, we will got escort to do, and I said, them. I mean, um, we'll pick them up in the middle of the we'll channel escort and escort them. them. Come over. We will escort them in. It's not border force. It's a border taxi service. RNLI, RNLI which it holds itself out to be this virtuous body that saves people at sea, and I'm sure they do save they people do. at sea. Yeah, the, oh, come they... on, the volunteers for the Royal National Lifeboat Institute are, are incredible heroes, come on. Sure, but they go into French waters, Not there's evidence of them going into French waters, uh, taking people who are perfectly safe on these dinghies, and remember these people get on these dinghies of their own free will, having paid good money to get on them, picking these people up and bringing them back to shore. And that can't be the job of the RNLI. There is a French equivalent, the name of which escapes me at the moment. They make no pickups in the channel. And what we've got to do is learn to turn the boats back. And the next criticism, well, no, whenever I say I, that... I, again, I never allow that yeah. stand because and you can't turn the boats yeah. back. They'll just say, they'll carry well, on going. The only thing you can do is you pick the people up and then you just simply take them to the French shore again. And they, the French should have an agreement that we can do that. The fact that the French don't want to do that isn't because, oh, if only we had Keir Starmer in charge of those negotiations, Emmanuel Macron would agree to it. It's because they don't want the people back. They're glad to be shot at them. Absolutely. But, you, but Julia, I'm going to disagree with you. You can turn the boats back. Belgium has a similar problem with people leaving their shores on dinghies. 90% of those boats are intercepted at sea and sent oh. back to the shores by Belgian authorities. They are stopped. And the Italians need to get a grip of their problem. So do the Western Balkans and the Greeks. They're dealing not with dinghies. They're dealing with ferries and much bigger ships. Mm. They need to learn from the Australians who had Operation Sovereign Borders, who, including you know, the, the taking control of these boats and sailing them back to where they came from. We've got to develop some backbone in the United Kingdom. And I know, obviously, you've been talking about Hamas, you've been talking about what's going on in Israel. Whenever there is a massive military intervention in the Middle East, North Africa, Near East, there will then subsequently be an influx yep. of people potentially radicalised, you were talking about on your programme just before I got on, yep potentially radicalised, wishing to come into the UK and wishing to come here in order to do harm. We've got to get a grip of this problem. Absolutely. Suella Braverman, I thought, made a very brave speech for a cabinet minister. First time I've heard a cabinet minister actually spell it right out and all credit to her for doing so. But now we need to back that up with real action. And it doesn't come through domestic legislation for deportation. It doesn't come through streamlining the asylum service. It doesn't come through providing safe routes from France, of which there are already millions. It comes from enforcing our borders. Yeah. Other countries do it. We've got to start enforcing yes, our borders. Yes, in indeed. And again, this idea that that makes you nasty if you do it, or bigoted. It's very, very bizarre. A country isn't a country without national borders. I think this is something Absolutely. that a lot of EU nations are beginning to realise right now. Ben Habib, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, a uh, former uh, MP, uh, MEP, apologies, and now a deputy leader of the Reform UK party. Let me come to Brenda Chilton. Now, this was a major issue. Well, in fact, it was actually legal migration as much as illegal migration mm. on these boats. It's much more visible now, isn't it? Um, that was a big issue uh, during the break. 
Brexit campaign and you, you led the, the Labour Leave campaign, very unpopular in your party at the time, although not so unpopular with a lot of Labour voters, it turns out, with those red wall seats in 2019 and indeed the referendum result in 2016. Um, these, these figures, I mean, th this is laughable. I can imagine so many people will be reading the details about this tonight and tomorrow, this, this, this Hiwa Rampur guy, or is he, and just thinking... They're just taking... I'm just I'm trying to come up with a word that I can say on air. <laughs> taking the mick is the polite way of saying, but you know what I want to say. <laughs> they are taking the absolute... Beep, 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 beep. Coming over here, um, Clayton, you know, lying about who you are, um, then go, oh, I'm going to make some money bringing other people over here. And, I, I mean, it's just extraordinary. And this is happening under our noses. The, the scale of this is almost too fantastic to believe. Ten uh, that thousand. One person is capable of shipping 10,000 people across the channel. I think one of the areas we really need to focus on is the measures we've put in place that the British taxpayer have paid for on the French side, the fences, the patrols. I was recently in northern France, and as you come back to Calais... We let, uh, we let you back in? That, oh, you did, yeah, I got back in. <laughs> I wasn't checked. Um, but there are literally hundreds of people walking to Calais and not one copper or, friend, no. sorry, policeman um, stops and makes and they, inquiries and camps, to what they know doing. where their camps are. Yeah. But this is the thing, but this is across the whole of France now, and you see it mm. in Italy, you see it elsewhere, where they're just these encampments. And I just find it extraordinary that European governments are just going, oh, OK, this is... This is us now. Yeah. This is this is what the streets of Paris are going to look like. It's what the streets of London are going to look like. The streets of uh, Rome. Are look. We're just going to have people just camping out who are here illegally. We don't know who they are, what they're doing. We just hope that we just hope they're people who want a better life and they're economic migrants. But we don't know. And and that's a very good point that Ben Habib just made. Uh, with you know, goodness knows what's going to happen in the Middle East mm -hmm. over the coming days, weeks, months, years. We're going to have a whole load of people saying, I've you know, I've been fleeing from. From, from war in the Middle East. And we won't know who people are. Even you take Palestinians. Yes, there'll be many, many Palestinians who are who, who want peace. They want nothing to do with Hamas. But we also know polling, again, as much as we can trust that, it suggests that two-thirds of people living in Gaza support Hamas, which is a terrorist organisation. Do we, do we want people who support Hamas more than already do coming to this country? I'm thinking most of us would say no. Well, we certainly don't. And but how would we know? They're well, going to claim to be from wherever they're... Wherever it is... It's like people saying that... People saying they were from Syria in 2015 when they weren't. Well, this is one of the huge problems with the people crossing the channel, when particularly on the age issue as well, when they say, oh, I'm only a teenager, well, they've got a beard and they're yeah. six foot tall. Yeah. You're, you're, you had a growth spurt or yeah. something. Uh, it's extremely I need difficult. to do the GCSEs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's ex <laughs> extremely difficult to identify. Well, no, these it's people. not because you can just do you can do really clear, simple testing, uh, dental testing. But from where they're Which from. every other European country yeah. is doing, but we apparently thought was wrong. Well, and this, frankly, I mean, I, I, I know Ben quite well and I. I don't agree with him much, but on this, I do agree with him entirely. I think the nation does, we apart need... from the Guardian and the, and the, the BBC, mm. and if you bleed in the heart is, and the Liberal Democrats, the Labour Party and the Tory Party, everyone else is pretty darn clear on this. They really are. Uh, more from Brendan Children coming up. Uh, let's get more of your texts and tweets in reaction to, of course, the news in, uh, in Israel and Gaza, with more than 500 Palestinians known to have died, well, believed to have died, sorry, after an explosion at that hospital uh, last night. Palestinians and Israelis blaming each other for the attack. Halley has tweeted to say having seen this footage and heard the conversation I would say it was a failed Hamas rocket. Well, again, not Hamas. They're not claiming responsibility for it. Ian says the evidence I have seen proves it was not Israel. Besides, what would Israel have to gain from targeting hospital? That is about to be my key point. This would be an insane thing for them to do especially ahead of the US President's visit today. Uh, James has got in touch to say our ally thinks, sorry, our ally says it wasn't them. A terrorist state says it wasn't them. It's simple for me. We believe our ally. Well, coming up after the break, we'll turn to something completely different. Neil Ferguson, the man dubbed Professor Lockdown, admits that the government and their advisers knew that lockdown would cause economic misery. But they did it anyway. That's how the COVID inquiry evidence yesterday. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Neil Ferguson, everyone's favourite epidemiologist, the man dubbed Professor Lockdown, has admitted to the COVID inquiry yesterday that the government at the time and their advisers did know that lockdowns would cause economic misery and would hit the poorest in the UK the most. The Imperial College epidemiologist led the team that published a report in March 2020 based on computer models advising Boris Johnson, the then Prime Minister, that epidemic suppression 
was the only viable strategy at the current time. But that's what he meant was lockdown. He later resigned from SAGE for breaking the rules himself, but remained a government advisor to this day. Well, let's talk about this now. I'm joined by political and social commentator James Melville and still in the studio is uh, Brendan Chilton as well. Uh, good afternoon to you, James. Hi, Julia, you thank, well? Well, thank you very much for joining. Well, apart from still seething with anger, we spoke with Professor Carl Hennigan um, about this, uh, of course, Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine, mad idea, using evidence to make policy, uh, yesterday, uh, looking ahead at what he was going to say. Um, but the revelations that we had from Neil Ferguson uh, yesterday at the COVID inquiry, this is the second module looking at government decision making. We now know that uh, at the end of October, Halloween of all dates, uh, uh, Dominic Cummings, the government's then chief advisor to, to the prime minister, is going to be giving his evidence. Everyone, let's face it, is trying to make themselves look like they were doing the right thing at the time. Everyone wants to to, you know, to, to basically cover themselves in glory and everyone else with the proverbial. But it is absolutely fascinating that Professor Neil Ferguson has basically said that, look, you know, he didn't push for restrictions. That wasn't his job. He was an advisor. But he, it's been made really clear in what the evidence was that was heard that, that they were aware that the, the impact of locking down would be devastating. Yeah, but this wasn't discussed at the time, was it? You know, anyone who suggested this, um, pointing out not just the economic impact, but a whole heap of collateral damages because of lockdowns, were smeared as a COVID idiot, and the debate was shut down. Um, and slowly but surely, the data comes down the tracks, and we see that actually lockdowns is probably the biggest public health disaster in the modern era. And what's shown from this as well is the one country in Europe, the outlier who went against that, Sweden, who kept everything open, schools, businesses, no mask mandates. Guess what? Three years on, they've got the lowest excess death rates in the round. Um, and and that, by the way, times... I need to stress to people, and that's compared with, inclu so includes all the other Nordic countries, because people say, oh, you can't compare yeah. Sweden with Britain or France or America because there's not as so much population, blah, blah, blah. No, compared with other Nordic countries with similar populations, they have done way better when it comes to total excess yeah. deaths, not just of people in their 90s dying of COVID, but people in their 30s dying from untreated cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it was all aspects. You know, yeah. if we're talking about public health policy, it should be all aspects of health. And that seemed to be forgotten about a little bit as well, considering, look at our waiting lists now, at record levels, because there was a massive prioritisation towards COVID and nothing else. On every single level, this was a policy disaster. And this needs to be brought out in the inquiry. So it can never, ever happen again. We should have taken the, the road of Sweden. The government initially did, yeah. but they lost their nerve. And they lost their nerve because people like Ferguson inflated modelling that those figures never actually came true, combined with a whirlwind of media attention to push Britain into forms of restrictions, mandates and lockdowns, and, which have and, caused and huge economic from, damage. A lot of pressure from the media. Again, the media is showing all these pictures of what's happening in China. A lot of that we now know was actually just propaganda, people dropping down in the street and being picked up by ambulances. Um, you know, if you were that ill, you were going to die of COVID. You weren't walking around the streets. Uh, what was happening in Italy, again, the focus on those few hospitals that were overwhelmed in northern Italy, whereas that simply wasn't the case in the rest of the country. And this view that we would just basically heading to Armageddon. So many people have said to me since that, yeah, but we didn't know then what we know now. You can just go back and watch the press conferences that were given with the Prime Minister at the time and with Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance. They were saying at the time, pretty much everything we know now, this is low risk to, 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 to children. That's why we're not going to close schools. It wouldn't make any difference to uh, whether or not we, uh, you know, in terms of marginal difference at all uh, to the spread of the disease. But also making it really clear, you can't basically suppress a virus. The aim of that first lockdown, supposedly for three weeks, was to flatten the curve so we wouldn't have our healthcare services overwhelmed in one go, we would spread it out. And then that all got forgotten because, well, you know, people love their lockdown. But one of the things I find fascinating that's been pointed out is that Professor Neil Ferguson in this evidence, um, he's basically said, look, he didn't overstep the line. He got dragged into sort of policy making, but he says he didn't say, you know, we need to do this now. However, his paper on the 16th of March, which led to the lockdown, explicitly concludes, we therefore conclude that epidemic suppression is the only viable strategy at the current time. Now, suppression, what, what they mean by that, and they, they define it, 
A minimum policy for effective suppression is therefore population-wide social distancing combined with home isolation of cases and school and university closure. So they, he says they weren't actually saying we should lock down, except that the paper with the modelling said we need to lock down. Yeah, but the government ignored that themselves. Yeah. Certain members of the government. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the only hospitality industry that was open at that time seemed to be down Whitehall and Westminster. Yeah. Um, and actually, we, we came a long way from three weeks splatting the curve because a few months later, it became ridiculous restrictions, the rule of six, crazy policies didn't make any sense. Scotch eggs, um, but only thought... no, st sitting down, not standing up. I mean, one-way systems yeah. in supermarkets. I mean, where do we go? I mean, for instance, you go to a nightclub. You could dance without a mask, but if you're standing by the bar, you have to wear a mask. I mean, it was just nonsense, the whole thing. And I think, sadly, no, the thing is, because... you say that. See, Brendan Chilton's with me. We're both laughing at that, and we all laugh about it now. And again, that some of those press conferences over this period, people are laughing. This was a democratically elected government and, and democratically elected parliament saying, yeah, yeah, fine, to everything. And, 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 and political and scientific and medical advisers all sort of nodding along and agreeing to what we now, you know, taping up benches. You couldn't, you couldn't go for yeah. a jog in the park and then sit on a bench for a couple of minutes. Um, you know, my, my mother in her late 70s being worried that, but if I go for a walk, they're going to tell me off to sit on a bench. And I said, if they tell you off for sitting on a bench, tell them to sod off. What do you care if you get a phone? Sod off. Go away. I'm a 79 year old. I want to sit on a bench. But it is absolutely extraordinary that we can look at it now and go, oh, well, that's all crazy. Yeah. It happened. Yeah. It didn't happen 100 years ago. It happened a couple of years ago. Why are so many people trying to rewrite history and why are so many people trying to just forget all about it? Yeah, it, I mean, it's a serious point to this. The serious point being it can never happen again. And I think, you know, if there is anything like this again, we start from a very different base of support against all these restrictions and mandates and lockdowns. And it got even more sinister than as well as all the stupid rules and restrictions that didn't work. It slipped into something that was unbelievably illiberal and draconian, and that was vaccine passports. I mean, that for me was even worse than the lockdowns in some ways, because, you know, that is ultimate form of authoritarianism, discrimination on medical choice. And it's lest we forget this, it seems like the inquiry's heading in one direction, trying to, everyone's trying to justify their existence and how great they were. Actually, it should be the diametric opposite. These people who are behind these measures should be called out to make sure that this never happens yeah. again. Because oh. it comes back to the original point about the collateral damages. It's not just about economic impact, yeah. it's about kids' welfare, yeah. mental health well, issues. All of which There's was flagged. businesses that were forced to shut against... All, you know, of, no all of this was own. flagged at the time by people. I remember domestic violence charities talked about it early on, cancer charities within a matter of weeks. And again, we were told we're not going to lock down schools, that we close schools, it wasn't making any difference, and children aren't at risk, um, and, it's, and then we don't want their education to suffer, and we re locked down more than any other country apart from, I think, Italy on, when it came to schools. Let me stay on the line, if you will, but let me just bring in Brendan Chilton. You were somewhat, again, speaking out on this. People were aware, and people were saying, now, the whole line is, we didn't know... It was we didn't know we didn't know about the collateral damage, but we also didn't know just you know how dangerous this disease was. We thought it was a lot more dangerous than it is. I mean, some people are still walking around like they think the plague is here. It's not Ebola, people, and it's dangerous for some people. For most of it is not, which is something that Chris Whitty and Patrick Vallance said on on our screens in one of the March press conferences before we locked down with the panic over this computer model. But People are just refusing to admit the truth. You know, it's all out there. We, we, we had the press conferences that we, this evidence is out there, but they want us to forget it. Why? Because they don't want to accept responsibility for the social crimes they committed. Um, I like you use the word crime. It is a crime. What we did to our elderly, petrifying them, was a crime. The huge backlogging hospitals, the crisis in attendance and education, soaring interest rates, inflation and a stagflating economy is all as a direct mm. consequence of the measures that government, supported by the opposition, implemented. And everyone acts as if they're surprised. Uh, no, it, it's amazing. Oh, look! Oh, look, all, <laughs> these, kids, all these kids can't read. If... Oh, look, and, got mental, <laughs> and they've all got mental health problems because they've been locked in their homes on their own on a screen for, for, for the best part of two years. Oh, look, the economy is completely damned. It's, it's, it's extraordinary that they're trying to get out of it. And the fact that we are where we are now with, as I say, a stagnating economy, very high inflation, is as a direct result of shutting down an economy yep. uh, for two years. You can't just switch it back on and expect things
things to go back to normal. Absolutely. James Melville, coming back to you, there's another story we were talking about earlier, this, uh, uh, this letter to Westminster Declaration about, you know, the right to freedom of speech and also not being censored online. We've only got a minute or so, but, but this is crucial, isn't it? Because it was massive censorship of what people yeah. like you and I and, and people, you know, far more than us, medical professionals, scientific professionals were saying about COVID. It's absolutely vital we don't have that censorship so we have those alternative opinions so we can actually get to the truth and, and, and we don't do something as insane and criminal as was done to us. Completely. Freedom of speech is paramount. It's a pillar of our society. You know, if someone says something that is wrong, we have the consequences of freedom of speech. We still have that freedom. And that comes back to what you're saying about the whole COVID era. If you know, the government have their way and the regulators have their way, especially in terms of online, then we lose our voice. You know, the government try and shut us down because we disagree with the government. Yeah. I mean, that's a whiff of sort of like East Germany in the 1970s. Yeah. That should have no, we should have no part of that. We should have the right for respectful discourse, alternative opinions. And if those opinions call out the government, good, that's part of democracy. Yeah. And any attempt to try and shut that down, it's, it becomes like a Trojan horse yeah. because it, be, it becomes abused. The government claw more and more suppression on this. As we have seen. And we and shouldn't have still, that in our society. Still doing it now, absolutely. Um, James Melville, uh, thank you very much indeed. You've been on the right side of history on this. I'm certainly sure of that. Uh, big thanks to Brendan Chilton, um, right side of history on Brexit and on lockdowns. You've got a good track record. People doing should well. listen to you more, <laughs> including, including the Labour leader. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you'll come back again. Sadly, that is the end of the show. I don't know how it goes so quickly. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Please do join me, same time tomorrow. Up next, it's David Bull. Have a great afternoon. This is Talk TV.